You may be seated. Good afternoon. On behalf of Mike's family, David, his elder brother and sister-in-law, Laura, and Mike's fiance, Marquita, thank you for taking the time to be here to remember and honor the life of a great man of God. That man was Dr. Mike Adams. To his family, Mike was a brother, a brother-in-law, an uncle, a nephew, and the fiance to Marquita. To the rest of us, Mike was a Christian colleague, a friend, a confidant, or a, as I often told him, my homie, my white homie. And if you knew Mike, like many of us at Summit Ministries, you knew him to be the ultimate pun master. Sorry, Scott, your jokes are not as good as Mike's. Maybe you still have a chance. We are gathered here in this beautiful church to, yes, mourn the early and shocking loss of a beloved man. But let me say, no matter how sad this is for all of us, we are also here to express our gratitude to God for giving us such a great brother, fiance, and friend. We are here today to celebrate Mike's life and hopefully leave here inspired to do more with our lives as we reflect on the great work that Mike did in the name of Jesus Christ. At this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Steve Owenby to come up to lead us in a time of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me at this time? as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today because you are our comforter. We call upon you because you're the one who gives us hope. And we begin this time together in prayer because we know that peace comes, Lord, not ultimately from the words of men, but from you and your eternal word. We turn to you because turning to anyone else or anything else will only leave us confused, angry, and even discouraged. We cry out to you, Father, because you are the one who can give us joy in the midst of our sorrows. 
peace in the midst of our storms, meaning when things don't make sense, hope when our world seems shattered, faith when we feel discouraged, and strength to continue on when we feel weary. Lord, we gather here not merely to remember and honor a man, a man that we counted our friend, that we loved. But Lord, we gather here today because we know you are our help. You are the one who protects us, cares for us, loves for us, died for us, saved us, and gives us an eternal inheritance through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, you tell us in everything to give thanks. And Lord, we may not give thanks for everything, but we do give thanks even in the midst of this situation. And Father, I ask today that you would help us to remember to be thankful for a few things related to our, our brother, Mike Adams. We thank you for his faith in Christ. We thank you for his example. We thank you that because of your faithfulness, we can have confidence that one day we will see him again. And we thank you that we will get to see our loved ones, but more importantly, we will get to see Christ. We thank you, Father, for the way that Mike touched our lives, and we thank you that his life and our lives are not defined by any one moment of weakness. We thank you for your faithfulness. So, Father, I ask that your blessings would be upon our time here today. And I pray that this service, Lord, more than anything else, it would be the time that we remember your faithfulness in our lives. And I ask you to be with each person who shares today to encourage our hearts. I ask that the gospel would be clear. And I ask that your holy name would be praised and exalted. And I pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. You know, in John 11, there's a great story, and all of us, I'm sure, know this story. Jesus was not there when Lazarus passed away. And we know that Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved his sisters. He was very close to this family. Matter of fact, if you look at Scripture in a chronological order, this is a place where Jesus spent his last week when he would go do some rigorous teaching, when he was being attacked, when he was trying to prepare his disciples before he gave up his life, he spent time with his family. When they heard that Jesus had arrived, they wanted to be with Jesus. And if you remember the words of Martha, Jesus, we know if you've been here, this would never have happened. And Jesus said these profound words, words that we know that our dear brother Mike embraced and believed wholeheartedly. In John 11, verse 25, Jesus said to Martha, as he says to us today, I am the resurrection in the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Those are profound words that come from our Savior Jesus. Words, as we remember and reflect the life of Mike's, that he believed in, that he preached, that he taught. And when he shared his testimony, and we take comfort in that here today. Years later, the profound philosopher, theologian, the apostle himself, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice these words that he expresses to the Christian mind and soul. He shares these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. For we know that the tent that as our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we should be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. 
So we're always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, says Paul. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him in everything. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Dave, Marquita, Laura, and family, may you take comfort in those words from Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul. We are not here because his life is over, his life has just begun. Because we know that Mike Adams, who we loved, put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. At this time, I'm going to ask for Dave to come up, the elder brother of Mike, to share a few thoughts and to share some great testimonies of what people had to say about his brother. Thank you. As soon as the news began to spread, the condolences began to flow in. And on behalf of the family, I want to thank you all for that. Your kind words have been comforting, and they've also been enlightening. Because I always knew that Mike was popular, but until I saw these hundreds of messages, I did not realize the extent of his popularity. And not just the breadth of his popularity, but the depth of his popularity, because popularity can be a shallow and fleeting thing, but Mike's, Mike's case, it was deep because he was impactful. And I did not fully appreciate that until I read all of your stories. So I wanna thank you for that. And I also wanna share just a few of them with you. Uh, one person wrote, Professor Adams taught me life lessons that will never be forgotten. He was always quick to help his students and instilled a quest of justice that will stay with me forever. He was truly an incredible man who fought for change. Another person wrote, Dr. Adams was the best professor I ever had. I thank him for all he taught me as well as his endless mentorship and guidance. I wish I could reach out to him now as I start law school, a goal he helped me achieve. Another person wrote, Mike was the reason I pursued a PhD in criminal justice. And someone else said, he showed me compassion and kindness when he really didn't have to, but he came alongside me at the most difficult time in my life. Another person wrote to me, despite the politics, most people don't know Mike's graciousness. On numerous occasions, he met with my son to help him and advise him and coach him on how to study for the LSAT free of charge. He did this out of the goodness of his own heart, never even asking what side of the aisle he was on. Someone else wrote this. Two years ago, Dr. Adams met me in his office. He gave me a mini speech that, in the moment, I found slightly offensive. But after going home, I, found, I realized this speech was to teach me not to let things hold me back from success, even though they are things that I can't control. He also spiked my interest in becoming a DEA agent in order to get drug dealers off the street. Before Dr. Adams, I didn't think I could be an agent. I didn't think I was strong enough. But after Dr. Adams, I know that as long as I push forward and view obstacles as opportunities, I can accomplish anything I can set my mind to. I'm going to get my DEA badge in honor of the legacy Mike Adams left in my life. Another person wrote, um, uh, uh, Mike uh, changed my stance on abortion during a seminar and he ignited a desire within me to actually take Christianity seriously. And then another person wrote, Dr. Adams was the only reason I continued on in my major after my freshman year. I deeply admired his dedication to his students and his work. And someone else wrote, our entire family has been changed by better knowing, for the better by knowing Mike. And another person said that Mike uh, helped them in college, law school, and once upon entering the working world. Um, 
Uh, just a couple more of these. Um, one person said, those who, who knew him uh, knew his profound love and respect for his students. He was what a professor was supposed to be, challenging, provocative, uplifting, and teaching not only the subject matter, but how to reason, not what to think, but how to think. Um, <clears throat> Someone wrote that uh, he was my professor in a criminal law class, which was the most informative and interesting and greatest learning experience of my life. Someone else said, I signed up for every class I could because he made a huge difference in my education and my life. Uh, and um, well, there's, there's, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more of those, uh, so many more, but I think you get the picture. And besides, uh, I believe these gentlemen have a few things they would like to say too. Thank you very much. Let's stand together. worship the Lord today together let's praise him for his faithfulness
When Teddy Roosevelt described the man in the arena, he was not speaking of Mike Adams, but he could have been. For Mike was a man of great devotion who strove valiantly. At times he knew the pain of failing while daring greatly, but he also knew in the end the triumph of high achievement. For he spent himself in the worthiest of causes. You see, Mike's life showcases the power of God, his power to change a man, his power to use a man. When Mike came to UNC Wilmington, he was one of the leftist atheists who fill so many faculty lounges, the last person one would imagine becoming a vocal conservative Christian. So what happened? Well, God worked. In 1998, Mike visited a prison in Ecuador, and God used the rampant injustices there to show Mike that he exists. The next year, a mentally challenged death row inmate told Mike about reading through the Bible, something that Mike realized that he, with his PhD, had never done. So he started reading, and God's word transformed him. By 2000, that atheist leftist professor believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to pay for his sins and give him eternal life. When the Apostle Paul told us to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, he did not know Mike Adams. But he knew his Savior. And when Mike met the same Savior, his entire way of thinking was transformed. He started sharing his newfound biblical worldview using his irrepressible sense of humor and love of puns. He titled one of his first columns, The Campus Crusade Against Christ. And the rest, as they say, is history. But now, no longer was he the rising star of his department and a magnet for accolades. In 2006, Mike applied for promotion. Not only was he denied, but his chair claimed that he failed in every area of review teaching, research, and service. And when he learned this, he was staring at his, not his one, but at his two Professor of the Year awards hanging on his office wall. Mike then made a simple but momentous decision to call Alliance Defending Freedom and insist that UNCW obey the First Amendment. That's when our team began representing him something I had the honor and privilege of doing for 14 years. After filing suit, we uncovered all sorts of evidence that university officials had violated the law. They chastised him for his columns. They ignored promotion criteria. The chancellor tried to change those standards to target him and then ordered secret investigations of him. They gave him low marks for his teaching without ever watching him teach, while he received some of the highest marks from his students. They said he didn't research, but he outpublished all but two of his colleagues. They hardly mentioned his scholarly articles, but complained and griped loud and long about his columns. And they even allowed someone who falsely accused him of a felony to vote on his promotion bid. All this 
because they couldn't tolerate someone with different views. Despite all this evidence, we lost at the district court because the district court ruled that Mike's columns, books, and speeches lost all First Amendment protection when he mentioned them on his promotion application. Yet God worked even in that moment of defeat. We appealed, and the next year, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit ruled in Mike's favor, setting precedent that protects all professors. Later, the Ninth Circuit relied on Mike's case to do the same. By taking a stand, Mike set legal precedent that protects thousands of professors in 14 states and two territories. But Mike's case was not over. When we returned to the district court, the university was still defiant. At one point, it asked Mike to drop his case, resign, and apologize on the way out the door. Now that was not hard to turn down. In March of 2014, after seven years of litigation, after seven years of working every day with people who hated him and mocked him, Mike finally got his four days before a jury of his peers. Afterwards, it took the jury less than two hours to eat lunch, elect a foreman, and return a verdict in Mike's favor. That moment was unforgettable, especially the sight of Mike in tears at how God had vindicated him and honored his faithfulness with victory. Soon, the court ordered the university to give Mike his long overdue promotion and years of back pay. And that year, UNC Wilmington became one of ADF's most significant ministry friends. <laughs> but Mike would remind us that this is not a story about him. A profoundly humble man, he used to say that he was writing a new book, 12 Steps to Humility and How I Made It in Five. <laughs> His life showcases God's power. Only God could transform a leftist atheist professor into a steadfast follower of Christ and a valiant defender of truth, and then use him to change the legal system, turning defeat into a landmark victory. When Teddy Roosevelt described the man in the arena, he observed that our nation's success or failure will be conditioned upon the way in which the average man, the average woman, does his or her duty. First in the ordinary, everyday affairs of life, and the next in those great occasional crises which call for heroic virtues. Mike answered that call with boldness, faithfulness, and humor. This is just part of the reason that I will so dearly miss my client, my comrade, and my friend. But nothing would please him more or honor him more than for the story of how God led him to follow Christ, to stand for truth, and to defend liberty to inspire you to do the same. And when you do, you will discover, as Mike will tell us in just a few moments, making him one of the few to speak at his own memorial service, that no matter what trials or opposition you may face, and no matter the end result, you will not be alone. For scripture tells us that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who heart, whose heart is loyal to him. Thank you. I got an invitation to speak in North Raleigh, North Carolina uh, at a Baptist church, and I went and I gave a speech on the trial, and I just kind of talked about what we'd gone through and our epic battle, and I did that, and when it was over, I was walking out of the church, and the most incredible thing happened. Someone comes up and grabs me by the bicep, and I turned around, and I look, and there is an elderly black man who grabs me by the arm, and he just looks down at me. He's about six foot four, and he looks down at me, and he says... I just want to thank you for that thing that you've done for our people. And I just, it really caught me off guard because I said, my goodness, this is a man who lived through segregation and one of the few people in this country who realizes that we are all involved, black and white, in an epic civil rights struggle in the United States of America. That's what he meant. 
And I responded to him by just uh, looking and, and, and what I always do when people try and compliment me on what I've done, it just was so easy to do. It was so right to do. I get a little, I feel awkward when they do that. So I said, well, you don't understand. The Lord's been raising me up to do this thing since 1993 when he brought me in as an atheist and he knew what my fate would be. He knew that I would convert. And that elderly black man looked at me and he stuck his finger in my face and he says, no. He said, the Lord been raising you up to do this thing since you was a little boy. And he turned and he walked off. Wow. And it put things into perspective because as I look around this evening, I see a lot of young people. And uh, your battles are going to be epic. Your struggles are going to be great. But let me tell you something. You're here for a reason. You're not here by chance. You're here because the Lord's been raising you up to do something great since you were little boys and little girls. And this is not chance, this is providence. This is providence. Giddy up. That's what Mike would say to that. Now, memorial services are normally somber. Mike does not want this to be a somber event. This is called a celebration. So we're each taking five minutes to demonstrate or show a different aspect of Mike. So I want to show more of his funny side, if that's okay, which was 90% of Mike. And it, it wasn't, it was 12 steps to humility and how I made it in five, but actually Travis, he told me he made it in four. Okay, <laughs> I'm just letting you know. A couple of weeks before he died, uh, my wife Stephanie and I were sitting on our patio with Mike and I said, Mike, uh, you like corn on the cob? And he said, I love corn on the cob. Do you know I once dated a girl from Iowa? Yeah, she had a cornfield in her backyard. She turned out to be a stalker. <laughs> and then when his hair tarted, started to change, he said, you know, you know what I am now? I'm now a gray rights activist. <laughs> and he literally, I think, had the best subtitle of any book I've ever heard, especially a political book. As you know, the book is titled Letters to a Young Progressive, how to avoid wasting your life protesting things you don't understand. If there's not more relevant book out there than that right now, and you can still get it, ladies and gentlemen, it's out there. That's Mike's latest book. But probably the, the story that will tell you the most about Mike is a story that he told in our Fearless Faith seminar. Myself, Detective J. Warner Wallace, and Mike would travel around the country and do a Fearless Faith seminar. And who better to have in a seminar called Fearless Faith than Mike Adams? And so I would do the opening, and then I'd introduce Mike. And I, this is the way I'd start the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike S. Adams graduated 734th out of 740th students in his high school class. And now he's a professor teaching your children. <laughs> And I would put up a bumper sticker that said, I hate Mike Adams. And people would be going, why would you say I hate Mike Adams? And I'd say, well, do you know the man who made up this bumper sticker? His name is Mike Adams. And he would come out. And here's what he would say. He said, oh, I know you're probably wondering why there's an I hate Mike Adams bumper sticker. He said, on April 30th, 2009, I went to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst which is like going into a communist country. <laughs> and as I'm walking to the, the building where I'm supposed to give my speech, I'm walking with my host to give a pro-life speech, which Mike did, and Scott's going to tell us about that, about the pro-life activism that Mike had. I'm going to this, and I see this huge sign on the side of the building, and it says, blank Mike Adams. It wasn't welcome. It began with an F, and it's a word we can't speak here in church. And so the host is going, oh, Dr. Adams, I'm just so, so sorry. He goes, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, I get it. And then he said, as I'm walking up to the building, I see on the second floor, through the glass windows, there's a bunch of protesters up there. I hate Mike Adams, I hate Mike Adams. He said, you know, I think I'm going to go up there and join him. <laughs> so he goes up there, 
And they're all with their signs and they're pumping their fists. And Mike is up there going, yeah, I hate Mike Adams. He's a bigot. He's full of hate speech. I hate Mike Adams. And finally, they look over at him and they go, it's Satan. <laughs> now, of course, they don't really believe in Satan. They don't believe in evil, but they think Mike's evil. And they say to Mike, what are you doing here? He goes, I'm about ready to give a speech. What are you doing here? And they said, you shouldn't be here. And he said, well, yeah, I saw that sign you put out there. And he goes, they go, oh, that wasn't our sign. And he goes, that wasn't your sign. Well, who put that sign out there? They said, oh, they're from the Coalition Against Hate. <laughs> and Mike would say, that's gold. You know how he always said that? That's gold. You can't write that. You can't make that up. The Coalition Against Hate says blank Mike Adams. And so he said to them, well, what group are you with? And they said, well, we're, we're with the communist group of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And he goes, oh, isn't that cute? You're communists. And then he said, um, he said, do we have anything in common? Well, no, we really don't. Why don't you just go down there and give your speech? Why don't you just get out of our space? And he said, you don't understand. You're communists. You don't have your own space. We share space. Come here, give me a hug. He said nobody would take him up on it. Meanwhile, he looks over and some guy has taken out his iPhone. And he starts to, he's been filming what's going on. And it winds up on YouTube, this whole interaction. And he said, I get a call from a friend of mine. His name is Jimmy. Let's call him Jimmy, because that's his name. In fact, I think his name is Jimmy Duke. Jimmy, are you here right now? I don't know if Jimmy's here, but Jimmy said, Mike, I saw what happened. You know what you ought to do? He said, you ought to make I Hate Mike Adams bumper stickers, and when you go to these places, you ought to sell them to these people who hate you, and it'll fund your website. He said, these people are so stoned that you can blindfold them with dental floss. And so he said, I did that. He said, I wish I could say I made millions, but I only made thousands. But it was the ultimate triumph of capitalism over communism. And do you know what the ultimate... The ultimate triumph over death is the resurrection. So giddy up, Mike. We will all see you again. And I am one of many kids from Colorado who feel like they've lost an uncle. I met Uncle Mike when I was three, and he taught me how to do a fist bump but he made sure I did it right with fireworks. And he was always very kind to the kids at Summit, and he always made sure that they felt loved and special. And he just always made sure he had a very special relationship with each of the kids. And he would, like, even though he was only here for the summer, he made it one of his goals to reconnect with all of us kids. And I remember one time at lunch, um, it was like the first time, the first um, time I saw him that summer. And during lunches at Summit, he was always surrounded by people trying to hear what he was going to say. And so I went and stood next to him, and he immediately stopped what he was talking about to give me a big hug and a fist bump. And he was just that kind of person, like he was, he loved the kids so much and he was very special to the kids and the kids were very special to him and he, no matter how busy he was, he would stop and say hello and he would always make sure that he said hi to all of the kids and he was just very special and he was really brave, and he was kind and caring, and we will miss him very much.
Like many of the people you're going to hear from today, I had the privilege and opportunity to know Mike, to work with Mike, to speak with Mike, and to spend an awful lot of time hanging out with Mike after we spoke. And I loved him. Hey, he was a good friend. He was uh, somebody that we spent a ton of time with each and every summer. Uh, but one of the things you're going to hear, and you've already heard from all of us, is not only that we loved Mike and we enjoyed Mike and we loved working with him, but we respected the heck out of him. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I'm sure I'm not the only one who waited for his articles to come out and read them fiercely with one of two responses. First, I wish I would have thought of that first. <laughs> or second, I can't believe he said that out loud. <laughs> Sometimes it was this, both responses to the same piece. He had this way with words. He had this way uh, to write. He was a heck of a writer and a heck of a thinker at the same time. And that's unusual. There's plenty of writers you can't think and plenty of thinkers you can't write. But Mike could do both, and he could do them really, really well. And I learned a lot about that, that craft, that trade, that patience from him. But the real reason I'm here, because there's a lot of us that had the privilege of working and speaking and traveling with Mike. The reason I'm here is that I'm that little girl's dad. And she's not a little girl anymore. She's 13. But she was three in that picture when Mike taught her to fist bump. Her name's Anna, she's my second daughter, my oldest daughter, Abigail, my younger daughter, Allie. When we told them that Mike had passed away, they cried and cried and cried and cried. And I've spent a lot of time since trying to figure out why. What got to them so much? Because they've had loved ones die before. They've had family members, and Mike wasn't a family member. We didn't see him throughout most of the year, every summer. When he was out at Summit Ministries, we'd see each other. My kids would go give him a hug. He'd come to our home and, and hang out in our garage, and, 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 and that was the relationship. There's plenty of people that my kids see on a weekly basis at our church. We have an older congregation, and some of them have passed away, and They've been upset, but why did they cry and cry and cry and cry? And even still, because of Mike. You know, several years ago when my daughters were, were young, I showed them an episode of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I mean, this is probably 25 years after the episode had been produced. A few years after Mr. Rogers, I think, had passed away. And at the end of that episode, my oldest daughter, who maybe is five or something like that at the time, looked at me and asked, could he see me? Now, I'm going to go ahead and say that this will be the only time you will ever hear Mr. Rogers compared to Mike Adams right here, okay? <laughs> None of you can use that. I took it. You got it? But that's what Anna, I think, was saying to us, and that's what we saw is that um, Mike saw them. He saw those little kids. He saw a lot of us too, but he saw those little kids. Each summer he would connect with them, and he didn't connect with all of them, he connected with each of them. He connected with each of them in a very individual way. There was one of the pictures that was on earlier of a little boy named Sammy, and, and I, we found that on Facebook, and if you actually look at the caption, he, he said something along the lines of, I taught Sammy something, and, and then I went to the Stone Street's house, that's us, and I taught little Hunter how to make fart noises with his mouth. <laughs> and he did. And he must have done it well, because he still knows how to do it really well <laughs> at really awkward times. That was how he connected with my then two-year-old son. How he connected with Anna when she was three, and then over and over and over again each summer for the next ten years. And how, she connect how he connected with Abigail, how he connected with Allie, is something that I'm very, very grateful for. Several years ago, um, I went to see a, a, a family that... Um, uh, as part of our ministry at the Colson Center, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I sat down with them, and I, and I said, uh, um, just get, kind of getting an update on who they were and, and, and what the family situation was and what they knew, and, and they said, you know, our, our daughter is a, a sophomore at 
uh, Vanderbilt University, and since she's gone there, she started seeing this guy who's an agnostic, and she's walked away from the faith, and she has really hard questions, and we don't know what to do. And, and I said, well, listen, have you ever heard of this place called Summit Ministries? I think it would be a place that if she's willing to go and engage that maybe could help her wrestle with some of the questions that, uh, that, that she has. And they, they said, yeah, I think maybe that would be interesting. They texted me uh, a couple weeks before uh, the session and said, hey, our daughter's there. Could you make sure to say hello? And I said, absolutely. And I, 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 I wasn't going to speak at that summit conference until maybe Wednesday morning or something like that. And and of course, the, if you know anything about the summit conferences, they begin on Sunday night. And so I wasn't going to be there till two or three days in. And so, uh, but some of the guys, Scott and Mike, were going to come up and hang out at my house after they spoke on Monday night, I think it was. It might have been Tuesday night, but it was either Monday or Tuesday. And so they came in and sat down and, 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 and I said, hey, Mike, I, I, want, I want to tell you about there's a, there's a girl there that you need to meet. And he goes, you mean Vivian? And I said, yeah, how did you know? And he said, we already met. We're having lunch tomorrow. And over the next two weeks, they spent lunchtime after lunchtime, mealtime after mealtime together. And in Mike's way of being able to just brutally speak the truth when it needed to be spoken and also lovingly look somebody in the eye and see them, he walked with her back to faith. And that's a really unique legacy. And it's one that I'm grateful for, not only as someone that I want to be like, but also I'm just grateful that my, my daughters were able to have that same experience with a guy who had courageously stood up in the ways that Travis described, but could also see a little kid in the eye and treat them as made in the image and likeness of God. In a minute, you're going to hear from Scott about how great of a pro-life advocate Mike was. And pro-lifers like Scott and Mike, who courageously defend the humanity of the unborn, often get accused of something. It's a silly little accusation, but they often get accused of only caring about children before they're born and not caring at all about after they're born. Now, I can tell you, at least in Mike's case, that wasn't true at all. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mike Adams. You guys are having a lot of fun this morning. Woo! All right. I'm here. Woo! We must have some Southerners here. Uh, my name is Mike Adams, and I'm a professor at UNC Wilmington and a uh, faculty member here at Southern. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Mike Adams. Thank you. It is so good to be here, but let me get started with a story, ladies and gentlemen. And I said, giddy up, because I'm from Texas. <laughs> So the way that Summit has affected me has been really interesting. Um, it's funny that I'll speak here and all these Summit kids will come up to me and say, thanks for speaking. And, you know, they're just shaking my hand and complimenting me and stuff like that. And I, I just am kind of snickering a little bit because I think it's funny because I actually can't believe I, I actually get paid to do this. Uh, it's such an honor and a blessing. Um, I know, obviously, that students come here and they're they're affected and they're equipped, but I've actually been equipped. Well, you know, I'm just sitting here. Minding my own business as usual. I got an idea. And things were getting really rough. It was just fantastic to be around here at Summit, interacting with the speakers, with the students, yelling at the dish bit. It's good for the body to come out here and be in nature. It's good for the soul to be exposed to the truth and you'll, you'll form um, everlasting, lifelong friendships as well. Well, I think we already know who wins in the final analysis. So what do we do between now and then? Well, we realize that the pursuit of, of justice and virtue and truth is intrinsically rewarding. There is no greater joy than standing up for the truth. Your right to life and your human value don't come from other humans. And that's why other humans cannot take them away. Thank you. You need to have a conviction that between now and the time that you die, every single time you encounter a person who says, I'm pro-choice, 
you recognize that it is your moral obligation to plant a stone in their shoe because you have absolutely no idea what will happen until you pass and wind up on the other side. I'm Jeff Myers, president of Summit Ministries. That video was put together by our Summit interns from this summer, many of whom had gotten to know Mike personally. For 12 summers, Mike drove from North Carolina, stopped along the way to visit some friends in, I think, Oklahoma, stopped on the way back to visit Dave and Laura, but came out to the Summit Ministries every single summer. And he was not just Dr. Mike Adams, to our staff, they, they actually called him Uncle Mike. He's the only professor who got to be called Uncle something. Except for one little girl named Caitlin, she called him Mr. Cutie. <laughs> oh, Mike could not get enough of being called Mr. Cutie. That's right, and, and Marquita, when you and he would go through the Chick-fil-A drive through and they would ask, what is your name? He would say, we're Mr. and Miss Cutie, right? That's just... But Mike, I would always tease Mike because he is a year older than me, but he looks younger because I did not wear my sunscreen the way I was supposed to. So I would always tease him with the students that he was my younger, older brother. And he, he hated that. And so he told the students, if Dr. Myers mentions my age during graduation, you have to sing Don't Stop Believing" by Journey. And I said something about, I want to thank all the people, and I especially want to thank Mike Adams, my younger, older brother. I had no idea what kind of trap I had just stepped into. And the students sang, Don't Stop Believing" by Journey, every single word, which I thought was actually pretty amazing because that song was written when their parents were still in junior high. But I especially loved how Mike spent time with our summer staff. And he dignified every job, what we call the dish pit. You have to be very careful how you say that word. He dignified every job, and he would be there with the apron on, no matter what the job was, being with those young adults. And they realized, you know, he may be a famous professor, but he's our Uncle Mike. We we can do great things, and we can also serve at the lowest level. When, when Mike died, one of my thoughts that just went through my mind was, it's as if God was saying, if I, if I were going to give you a gift, a co-laborer, somebody who would make every summer fantastic for you and for the, your fellow faculty members and for your students, somebody who would stiffen your spine, somebody who would chastise you when you needed it, but somebody who was always there with a ready laugh and a devastating whip, but you could only have him for 12 years. Would you say yes? And there's no question that we would absolutely say yes. What happened in those 12 years is really extraordinary. 1,000 summer staff members personally got to know Mike and be encouraged by him. And 15,000 young adults. You saw just some brief clips of Mike in the classroom. He was masterful in the classroom. What he did with the students was extraordinary. It was, it was almost like in Wizard of Oz. He's the guy who pulled aside the curtain to show the little man on the bicycle that was running everything. He took away all of their fear about going to college because they realized, I can do this. I can stand for truth. I can stand strong. In the last uh, few weeks of Mike's life, as you know, he experienced tremendous turmoil. And Stephanie, my wife, and I talked with him, prayed with him, FaceTimed. And there were times where he wondered whether or not he had really made a difference. And I, 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 I wanted to take that pain away from him because he made such a tremendous difference. I don't know... Only in heaven will we know how many babies are alive today because of Mike Adams. 
Only in heaven will we know how many young people stayed strong in their faith instead of straying away because of Mike Adams. I wanted to trade places with him. I wanted to take his pain onto myself. But I want you to know that that is not a trade that Mike would have made, especially knowing what he knows now. When two, I guess it was three weeks ago now when we buried Mike, I was looking at that casket and thinking, the casket of a person who dies in the prime of his life is evidence of God's cruelty. It just felt that way. And the night before that, I woke up during the night and I thought, well, I'll just read my Bible. And I'm in Psalms right now in my annual Bible reading plan. But God directed my attention to 2 Corinthians 5, this passage, Jay, that you read a little bit ago, a little bit ago, that our mortality will be swallowed up, not by death, but by life. That Mike knows as he is known, that for him, death has lost its sting. So the question for us is, how do we go on? Two days ago, a reporter asked me, he said, well, don't you think that his tweets, were, he read a couple of examples, don't you think that these are wrong? And I wanted to respond the way Mike would have, but I didn't. I, I knew all of Mike's little remarks, I could have said them, but I said to him, if you would have known Mike, you would have found him to be the truest kind of friend you could have. One who would tell you the truth in love and stand with you whether you agreed with him or not because he believed in your right to speak. So after Mike died, I wrote a, a column and found a quotation from Mike from one of his columns right about the time that his father passed away. I just thought this was extremely powerful. He said, we are all dying, folks. It is time to meet the people we love where they are and start talking. There is no need to wait until the holidays to start applying this principle. We can start today. We might not have tomorrow. I think that's Mike's charge to us today. A colleague of mine has aptly written that most people who say they oppose abortion do not lift a finger to stop it, and those that do lift a finger do just enough to salve the conscience, but not enough to stop the killing. Men and women, that was not Mike Adams. We had a tradition we enjoyed with Mike over the last nine years. Every December 22nd, he would arrive at our home just prior to Christmas, and the door would open up, and you know what his first two words were, giddy up. <laughs> and boy, did we. My wife, Stephanie, would prepare an outrageously good home-cooked meal for Mike, which as a bachelor is a gift. And then Mike and I would talk until the wee hours of the morning, not about girls, except for once this last time, but about what he truly cared about. He had one question on his mind. What can I do to save children? And I quickly learned after about the third year of him visiting, he wasn't coming to our house for small talk. He was on a mission. He wanted an assignment. He wanted to know what's the next thing I can do to make a difference on the pro-life issue. So in 2013, we mapped out a whole way that he could work pro-life arguments into his summit talks and into talks to Christian conventions. In 2014, he said, you know, I'd really like to know how I could work pro-life apologetics into my classes at the university and how I can put together talks that can resonate with secular audiences at other universities where they don't hold a Christian worldview. So we spent the evening mapping that out. And then in 2015, he said, look, uh, I want to take the fight right to our opponents. I want to start doing debates. So I set him up to debate my friend Nadine Strawson, the former president of the ACLU. And Mike and I spent that Christmas, December 22nd, prepping for that debate. He went on to do that debate. 
a short time later and absolutely nailed it graciously but persuasively. There was no doubt who the winner was in that debate. And then the next year, Mike says, we, we got to go further. So he says, we're going to call up Willie Parker, the guy who describes himself as the Christian abortionist, who's been on every talk show in the country being applauded for being the good Samaritan to women who need abortions. Mike spent a year and a half devouring everything Willie Parker ever said or wrote prior to that debate. In fact, about two months before the debate, when it was again December 22nd and he was at my house and we were sitting in the garage, huddled up, freezing because it was cold, we were going through line upon line of what he was going to say in that debate. And two months before that debate, Mike was all done. He had already done all his prep and boy did it show in that debate. If you saw that debate, you quickly learned that Mike Adams knew Willie Parker's book better than Willie Parker knew his own book. This was Mike Adams. You know what this is, men and women? A warrior. A warrior. And Mike wasn't interested in advancing his platform. He never once said to me, how can I better market myself? He had a different question. What can I do to save children? In other words, he demonstrated biblical love. And sometimes, men and women, love is costly. Sometimes our warriors come home hurt. I don't know what all that Mike was going through those final two weeks, three weeks. I can't even begin to imagine what it is like to have, feel like everybody in your professional circle literally wants you out of the equation where they hate you and attack you. Nevertheless, Mike stayed on message with the humans he felt most at risk. And I think if Mike were here today, he'd say these words. Don't stop believing. To which I would only add this. Believe the way Mike did, which was not just to feel pity for unborn humans, but to act as if he felt pity for unborn humans. Mike, you soldiered well. I'm going to miss you. And December 22nd will never be the same at our house again. Dr. Mike Adams meant more to me than I can put into simple words. Dr. Mike was so articulate, and yet he would always spend extra time with anyone who needed it. Everyone loved him. Children loved him. The students loved him. And, and all of his colleagues at Summit loved him. Dr. Mike had a way of making the people around him feel so seen and known and cared for. He taught me how to be bold in the face of opposition and to not back down when standing for truth. Dr. Mike Adams is my hero of the faith. I strive to be as knowledgeable and as confident as he always was, but also to pair that with the love and the patience that he always displayed. Uncle Mike stood for justice and truth. He was the greatest defender of life and liberty. He loved to laugh. He wholeheartedly pursued God. He was open-handed with his knowledge as he shared as much as possible with as many people as possible. He taught me the importance of standing up and speaking out for what is right. He taught me that no matter what hardships come, that it is wrong to give up on what is right. And I learned that I have a voice and that I should use it for those who cannot speak for themselves. 
It was clear how deeply he cared about advocating for truth and justice. And he defended the rights of the unborn in a way that was both intellectually compelling and also gracious and loving. Dr. Adams undeniably shaped who I am today and ultimately contributed to the two greatest gifts I have, my salvation in Jesus Christ and the calling God placed on my life. The lives saved through this legacy, from the defenseless unborn to many lost students whose lives were changed by his ministry, stand as reminders of that fact. As one of them, I am compelled to carry it on and pray that, that out of this profound loss, we too will speak truth and freedom to a world that needs it. Mike was a prime example of someone who fought the good fight, kept the faith, and has now finished the race. Until we meet again, Mike Adams, enjoy the one whose grace has covered all your sin and presented you blameless before his throne. Thank you for the speakers representing, I believe, the life of Mike very well. I pray, Dave, Laura, Marquita, that you guys have been comforted hearing these words and the impact that Mike has had for many, many years. I stand here this afternoon doing his eulogy. Never would I have ever imagined that I would be here today with you all. So Dave and Laura Marquita, I cannot begin to imagine the range of emotions that you have been experiencing. this past month. Yet I want you to know that even in your moments of sorrow and the anger and the despair that God is with you. God is right here with all of us in the midst of our deepest and darkest moments. I want you to know that Mike's fatal act may have ended his life here on earth, but his life is just now getting started with Jesus in heaven where there is no more pain, no more depression, and no more loneliness. That, my friends, is the hope that we have today. Fully knowing that Mike is resting in the loving arms of Jesus, how can we be certain? Because ever since Mike surrendered his life to Christ in the year 2000, Mike devoted his life to his Savior. Even in his final days on earth, Mike and I spent a considerable amount of time reading the Bible and talking about his salvation, that he had assurance that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior, and there was no denying that. One night after scarfing down several homemade chocolate chip cookies that my wife had baked for Mike, I remember opening the Bible and reading to him these words found in Psalm 32, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin, writes King David, to you, O Lord. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I then turned to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, which reads, So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. After reading these words, I looked up at Mike and there were tears that were rolling down his face. And he and he told me he was so moved with tears just thinking about how forgiving and loving God has been to him all these years. Although Mike's final weeks and days were extremely difficult and the weight of his depression worsened, Mike never took his eyes off of Jesus, the author and the perfecter of his faith. But why? Why would Mike do what he did 
if he was looking to Jesus. I don't think you or I can make sense of it all in order to answer that question sufficiently. But one thing we can openly admit in this room and watching online is that we all suffer. We all have our doubts. And we need to acknowledge that there are many who are consumed with deep-seated depression that never seems to let up. Even great men of the Bible like Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah and Elijah and the great prophet John the Baptist all had bouts of depression and suffered from the abuse of others. But let me say to everyone here today and watching online, there are many things that remain unknown and unanswered. Even in the final days of Mike's life, Frank, Scott, and myself were there for our dear friend. And together, the three of us have frequently questioned why this happened. Wondering to ourselves, what more could we have done to help Mike? It's been hard, to say the least. But nevertheless, we take heed. Because despite the questions that we all have, despite the heartache that we all suffer with and all the unknowns that we carry with ourselves right now that are in our heads as I woke up this morning preparing, looking over this eulogy, shocked that I'm about to come to this church because Mike is no longer with us. Despite all of that, my friends, we look to the one true and knowable God who will comfort us in our pain while we trust in his faithful guidance into the light of his truth. Please hear me. Suicide is never the answer. Mike's life was cut short by a deeply sinful and wrong choice, but his life should not be judged or defined by what he did in the end. We are not here to judge Mike based on one horrific decision, but instead, as you have heard from his closest friends today, we measure Mike's life on how he lived based on who he lived it for. And that's what matters. Taking one's life is certainly a loss of continual rewards on earth, but in no means a loss of salvation in heaven. That is where Mike is. Therefore, I want us to reflect on three amazing qualities of our beloved Mike. These are qualities that he possessed. These are qualities that we have heard already that we loved about him. Mike was a lover of God's truth. Mike was a freedom fighter. And Mike was a man with a gentle soul. In the video highlighting Mike's impact at Summit, he stated these words, quote, I think we already know who wins in the final analysis. So what we do between now and then, while realizing the pursuit of justice and virtue and truth, which is intrinsically rewarding, there is no greater joy. Catch this. This is from Mike himself. And we can attest to this, right, men? There's no greater joy than standing up for the truth, end quote. And boy, did Mike stand up for the truth. That was a great quality we admired about Mike at Summit. His assuredness and absolute truth and his unapologetic attitude about his faith in Jesus Christ was contagious. Quite frankly, it was inspiring. My two oldest of four, every summer when we would go to Summit, no matter how many times they've heard Mike's talks or the giddy up or the puns, they wanted to hear him. They wanted to hear him. That's how much he meant to so many. He inspired so many. So many young people are living their faith today in all these arenas because of what Mike did and how he led so well. No matter the challenge, the issue, or point of view he encountered, as a freedom fighter, Mike relentlessly stood up for free speech and freedom of one's religion even if that person's viewpoint ran contrary to his own. 
In addition, Mike also was an influential voice, as you've heard, for the pro-life cause. In his many years defending the life of the unborn, God used him to save countless precious lives. The white crosses outside the church lawn is just a symbol of the thousands of unborn lives aborted each day here in America. That was unacceptable to Mike. And it rocked him to his core, which explains why Mike was so brave and he exemplified great compassion when he was defending the unborn. And so we say with a resounding voice today, well done, good and faithful servant in the name of Jesus. And finally, there's no denying that even in the midst of Mike's bravery, he possessed a gentle soul. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards wrote, quote, all who are truly godly and are real disciples of Christ have a gentle spirit in them. And let me tell you, all of us who knew him so well, Mike certainly had a gentle spirit. Mike was so kind and gracious to people. As you've seen from the dozens of pictures, Mike loved his students and he sure did love our kids. He once told me one of his, one of his biggest regrets was not being a father. But then he would say to me, but I love being Uncle Mike. And I think it's safe for me to say on behalf of all the kids Mike touched at Summit, they will truly miss his big, bright smile, his big hugs, and his corny jokes. These are just some of the great qualities we all loved and admired about our dear, dear friend. And so as I close, allow me to share these profound words from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14, 7 through 9, to give us comfort and to give us some much-needed clarity. Paul writes, For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Now, at this time, I want to read you these, these words from Marquita. She asked me to read these, and we are working together just this past week, putting together something that she wanted to share with you guys today. I know many of you guys, even people watching, were not aware that Mike was engaged to Marquita. They were planning on getting married. And as you guys can understand, she is grieving and it's been hard. So I ask for your guys' patience and your grace as I extend to you on behalf of Marquita these words that she wants to share with you today. Marquita writes, I want to first thank all of you for attending Mike's memorial service today. I know he loved all of you and you certainly loved him. My name is Marquita and I was Mike's fiance. Like many of you, I too was greatly impacted by Mike on so many levels. For years, I had followed him and read every article he wrote. I always admired that he spoke out with such courage and conviction on the First Amendment, religious liberty, and protecting the unborn. His example as a Christian and a pro-life warrior inspired me to get more involved with my church in pro-life causes. That shared passion for defending the unborn is what brought us together. I reached out to Mike for help on a pro-life presentation I was preparing for my church. He was so gracious, encouraging, and supportive. He even convinced Scott Klusendorf to come on board to offer his guidance and expertise. Through this, Mike and I became friends, and in time, he and I grew closer, and eventually, we fell in love. Mike and I talked a lot about marriage and our future. Fulfilling God's purpose for us as a couple was important to both of us. We quickly realized that purpose would likely center around our shared passion of defending the unborn. Mike was in the process of completing a pro-life book and was looking forward to joining the pro-life speaking circuit full-time after his retirement from UNCW. He supported my dream to start a nonprofit specializing in pro-life displays and signage. In the spring, when we were making all of these plans for our future, 
we were unexpectedly hit with COVID-19. And that's when things at UNCW got really messy. We worked together to get through the crazy season we unfortunately found ourselves in. We didn't know how long the trials would last, but as long as we had each other and we looked to Christ, we believed we would make it through it all, refined and blessed at the end. But that's not exactly what happened. My dream and one I desperately wanted to see come true was to marry Mike and be a loving and caring wife to him. Never did I imagine that instead of marrying him, I would have to bury him. But I trust in my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will see me through the pain and grief. It, being, it brings me great comfort in knowing Mike is with Jesus in heaven. Today, you heard wonderful things about Mike, how he stood for truth, shared his testimony to thousands, fought for religious freedom, and was a mighty voice for the unborn. Mike truly was an ambassador for Christ. Therefore, I implore all of you not to waste your life, but to stand up for what you believe in, and do not allow the culture to silence your beliefs. A Bible verse that Mike would often quote to those weary of the enemy was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, where Paul writes, quote, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, end quote. I pray you will be a witness for Christ, just like Mike was to people all over the world. Thank you. God bless. And so you guys, as we conclude, again, on behalf of the family, thank you guys for taking this time. Thank you, speakers. Thank you for people watching online. We're going to enter a time of reflection as Christian leads us in this song. And as you hear this song, if, if you need to get right with Jesus, if you need to confess sin, perhaps maybe you have been battling with depression or you have some type of suffrage in your life, cry out to the Lord. If you're watching this right now and you feel that you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would take this opportunity here at Mike's memorial service. Just like Mike believed in Jesus Christ, that you yourself can know him personally. Jesus says the words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We saw in John 11, 25, he is the resurrection. Though we die, we continue to live. And as you've heard all of these profound, amazing stories, the impact that Mike have, if you have felt at this point, there's something nagging at you and you don't know quite what it is, perhaps, maybe even during this crazy time of COVID, the rioting in the streets and the chaos and, and the uncivil rest that we have been facing for quite some time. And you say, maybe that's it, Lord. Maybe I need to find rest in you, that you take this time as we reflect to find rest in Jesus, perhaps. God is tapping you saying, be like Mike. Remember that old thing with Michael Jordan, be like Mike? I want to be more like Mike. I want to become the next pun master, Scott. But this is a time that I want you guys to have, to reflect, to pray for the family. Pray for us. Pray that some ministers will continue to thrive, that we, with the example that we've had with Mike all these years, that we will continue to love and care for these students the way that Mike did. Let's take this time and reflect. Thank you. 
Would you join me at this time as we close in prayer? Father, we, we've been encouraged here today. Lord, to hear the words that have been spoken. God, our, our hearts are filled with hope. And Lord, we're, we're reminded, Father, that as we have um, been able to reflect upon Mike's life, Lord, that, um, that, that his hope was in you. His hope was in the cross. And knowing, Lord, that, that what Jesus did at Calvary was everything that needed to be done so that we could have eternal life if we put our trust in him. And God, I, I thank you. I thank you that, that Mike... Lord, not only expressed through his words that, that he has and had that faith in Jesus, but Lord, the life that he lived was a living testimony of that faith. And Lord, as Pastor Jason has, um, has, has put out the challenge, he, he's, he's, he's put out, God, the, the request here for, for those who may even be in this room, but, but Lord, I think of those that are watching online right now. God, if they don't have that hope, they don't have the hope that, that when they leave this world, that they will be with you. Then, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would, in a very real way, convict their hearts and that, Lord, you would draw them to yourself, that they would put their faith and trust in Jesus. Lord, may they reach out to us. May they reach out through Summit Ministries, through their website, to, to find the answers to the questions they may have about life and eternal life and forgiveness. Lord, I want to pray for the family. I want to pray, Lord, for, for Mike's family. I want to pray for Marquita. And I just pray, God, that you would continue to be the God of all comfort to them. Lord, I thank you, God, for the passage in Corinthians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercy and God of all comfort. Thank you that you bring that comfort to our hearts. And Lord, let, let this family, let Marquito, let friends, let those watching online feel that comfort in a special way. And we put our trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.